And now we have a special session on imagining a new future geography of food, a conversation between AGS President Marie Price and Kathleen Merrigan, who is the Executive Director of the Sweet Center for Sustainable Systems at Arizona State University. She is also the former Deputy Secretary of Agriculture during the Obama administration. Marie and Kathleen. Thanks, John. Hello, everybody. We're in for a treat. Dr. Kathleen Merrigan has been at the center of food systems research and policy for over three decades. Uh, currently, as John said, she's the executive director of the Sweetie Center for Sustainable Food Systems at Arizona State University. I got to know Kathleen when she was the director of sustainability at the George Washington University in the 2010s. And based on our conversations, I can't imagine a better person to help us imagine a future geography of food. In the 1980s, with a PhD in environmental planning from MIT, she worked on Capitol Hill. As a staffer for Senator Leahy, she assisted in writing the 1990 Organic, food, uh, or, or, oops, Organic Foods Production Act. And later at the USDA, Merrigan created, led, and managed the Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food initiative. She has developed USDA organic labeling rules. And as the US Deputy Secretary of Agriculture from 2009 to 2013 under the Obama administration, she was recognized by Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. In choosing her, Time Magazine wrote, if you've ever wondered who in government shoulders the complexities of moving an agenda forward in a fractured time and pushes on without getting soaked, here is your answer, Kathleen Merrigan. So Kathleen, we are excited to have you here. Um, given your vast experience in government and academia, and the private sector. What does the current map of food production look like in the US? And I understand we've talked about these questions before, and she has some slides for us. I was told you can't come here without slides. Yes. Really. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, I just want to say congratulations to you and your association for focusing on the future of food. It's so critical, as you've heard repeatedly over the last day and a half. Um, we need a lot more energy, a lot more ideas. We need you to be guiding your students into food systems work because we haven't figured it all out yet. And I um, some days get really distraught as to where we're at, but then I remember my students are brilliant and they're going to pick up where I left off and do important things. So hats off to all of you. So I wanted to start with this slide. Um, you may have seen these slides before. If you teach anything around food systems, go to um, just Google uh, how America uses its lands. Uh, this is a series of maps that were put out by Bloomberg in 2018. And uh, some people will quibble with them. They'll say it's not 100% cor correct. It's, but in the big picture, it's very, very useful. So this is actually showing different land uses across the US. And when I look at this map, one of the things that really strikes me is those pink blocks aren't as many as I might have thought. We hear about the world is it's increasingly urbanizing. But that pink doesn't dominate um, as much as I thought. It reminds me that America is still a very rural land and a suburban land. I'm also really interested in all that yellow there. That's the pasture land that we have, um, quite a bit of it. And then, of course, you look at those brown blocks, and that's the fertile, um, arable, wonderful land of the Midwest. But it's very interesting to see this mosaic. And students really, I mean, I can spend an hour in class going into all the different things that this map makes me think about. If you could show the next slide, please. Also in this series, after a whole um, series of maps, you culminate with this map. And what they've done is they are actually showing the land mass dedicated to different kinds of production. And when you look down under uh, Michigan, uh, you see food we eat. Isn't that a really small amount on the map? Students are so struck by that. How can that be? 
And they look at um, livestock feed, which eventually is food we eat, I suppose, and pasture land that also contributes to uh, the food that we eat. It's still not all that much. They also focus on that little tiny block that's barley, which is beer, because we can talk a lot about that. Um, but generally, it says to me that um, we have some major choices to make in our food system. We have a lot of, um, uh, of, food, uh, of our land that goes to ethanol, biofuels, a lot of it that goes to livestock production. Um, and, and maybe we're not making all the right choices. So anyhow, I recommend these series of maps. And I just really wanted to start our conversation, Marie, with saying, how are we using our land currently before we can say, how might we use it? Mm -hmm. So this is sort of status quo where we're at. Mm -hmm. We can talk about where we could go. Right. So what do you think this map might look like in 30 years, in 2050? Well, we've been talking about that quite a bit in the last day and a half. Next slide, please. I was really struck when I was Deputy Secretary in 2012 when we had a change in the plant hardiness zone map. I don't know how many people follow the plant hardiness zone map. <laughs> um, it's really uh, developed by the U.S. Department of Agriculture in large part for home gardeners. Um, this is not the, you know, the most important map for farmers, but it was the first time the plant hardiness map, map had changed in a long time. Mm -hmm. and like we all know, everything's shifting northward. I just, um, in Cynthia's maps, of course, we're much more sophisticated in all the modeling that's going on. But, you know, this was a real, you know, wake-up call for me in 2012. And starting to think about what does it mean for farmers? I am now living in the warm state of Arizona. It's so cold in this auditorium. I don't know what I'm doing here. Um, and, uh, and, you know, ranchers are struggling. Farmers are struggling. Um, they're probably not going to be able to grow the crops they're currently growing um, because of water shortages, long-term drought, wildfires. Uh, everything's changing. I also do work with, pe uh, with people in Alaska and the permafrost is melting, and all of a sudden they have arable land where they didn't before. Mm -hmm. So we have this whole um, confusion among people who grow our food as to what their futures might be. And it comes at a critical time because we have aging farmers. You've probably heard about this before. The average age of farmers in this country is around 59 years of age. We don't have enough young people coming back into food and agriculture to repopulate the people on our working lands. So if you're a farmer and you're already uh, looking at that food dollar, every dollar we spend at the supermarket, about 16, 17 cents goes back to the farmer. They're saying, that's not enough. It's not the livelihood I wanted for my family. You add on climate, mm -hmm. there's a lot of hesitancy about this lifestyle. And that is really impacting the aspirations of young people. And so we have a real um, national challenge here in terms of what we're going to do. And I think the map's a big part of it. Mm. So in earlier sessions today and yesterday, there was a lot of discussion of rural livelihoods mm -hmm. and whether it's in the US or other parts of the world. So what, how do you see rural livelihoods shifting? Where are some areas more prone to change than others? And especially your interest in ranching, which takes up a huge section of the map, so to speak. How do you see that changing over time? I don't see it changing as rapidly as I heard yesterday. Um, uh, um, Arvid at Rethink X talked about land the size of the mass of China being freed up, liberated from livestock production in a very short time. He put out some years of 2030 and 40% you know, going away. I don't see that happening. I just don't, for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, first of all, politics, that's my world. Uh, <laughs> the livestock industry is very, very powerful. Um, but also, I think that a lot of people look at that initial map that I showed and they say, okay, let's just repurpose that land. And if you spend any time in the West, uh, a lot of that land, probably its highest use is going to be for cattle production. Mm -hmm. You're not going to turn the lands around me into arable cropland. So um, 
that's something to consider. A lot of people who are ranching are doing so with small numbers of animals. In Arizona, um, nearly 60% of our producers are Native American. And a lot of people have one or two uh, beef cattle. It's part of their livelihood. So that makes me also think about globally, who are the people uh, raising animals. And oftentimes there's subsistence farm families where one or two animals is the difference between life and death. And I was really glad um, to hear from Moses yesterday where he's raising issues about gender equality, um, talking about the realities of subsistence farming in ways that we don't always have in our view shed here in the United States. Mm -hmm. So I do think, and if you can put on that next slide, please, that would be great. So I think that we spend a lot of time when we think about livestock with a vision of CAFOs, confined, concentrated animal feeding operations, uh, these big, big, massive operations, and they are, um, in my mind, terrible. But there are a whole lot of people that are really operating on a much smaller scale. Again, um, this land's not useful for everything. I remember the first time I went to South Dakota and, uh, and I was going to meet with some tribal leaders in the Badlands area, um, lands that the tribal nations had been quote unquote given. And it finally dawned on me, like Badlands. Bad lands, they're bad lands because you can't really grow anything here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think we have to have that reality check. Um, about women farmers, I just wanna say a note there. Uh, FAO and the World Bank came out with a study a few years ago and said if women farmers were given, by the way, women are the farmers of the world. That's not true in the United States. For decades I would go to meetings in agriculture circles and be one of you know, two or three women in the meeting hall. But, but we're, we're the outliers here. Women farmers are the, <laughs> I like this guy. Uh, so women are the farmers of the world and FAO, World Bank came out with a report and said if women were given the same access to education, leadership opportunities, other kinds of resources, we could see world food production increase on a daily basis to feed another 150 million people a day. So I, I never want to lose sight of the gender equity issue that Moses really drove home yesterday, I thought, in a powerful way. So um, this is a picture of one of my students in the green hat, Tucker Larson. He's uh, at a meat processing lab where they're trying to figure out <laughs> well, how to saw an animal in parts, but uh, they're mm -hmm. trying to figure out new ways to butcher animals. Dan Barber, who's a famous chef here in New York State, in Terrytown, New York, at Blue Hill at Stone Barns, and also Blue Hill in, um, in the city, uh, he says, you know, we spent all this time thinking about raising animals on grass. Maybe you've bought grass milk, grass-fed milk, or grass-fed um, meats. And sometimes when we eat those grass-fed meats, you go, chew it, chew it, kind of a little tough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Dan would say, well, you know, we spend all this effort raising an animal on grass, and then when it comes end of life process, when we um, process the animal, when we slaughter it, we butcher it, we age that meat, we do a cookie cutter to a grade-fed animal. And we need to think about the whole process at that end of life stage that really brings out the flavor of that grass-fed animal so that becomes a more marketable product. The other thing I'll say, I'm, I'm becoming um, a, a big Dan worshiper. He's been one of my closest friends for 20 some odd years and he does great stuff. And if you've never read The Third Plate, his book, yeah. I have all my students read it. It's wonderful, it's lyrical, it's a great Christmas present. Uh, you can buy it for yourself, um, Santa says. Anyhow, <laughs> um, what he's really pushing is not that we don't have meat, but that meat is not as dominant. It's not center of the plate. One of my favorite meals that he prepares is a parsnip steak. It's wonderful. And it has a little bit of meat sauce on it. Mm -hmm. 
So the meat's on the side. It's a much smaller portion. And I don't see a world where we're not going to have livestock. Um, and what I really, when I close my eyes and I give a big wish, it's about recoupling livestock and crop production. So we have that nutrient cycling that we want. We heard a little bit about fertilizer crisis yesterday. Absolutely, 40% of potash comes from Belarus and Russia, and that sort of got closed down, and we had this whole um, domino craziness about fertilizers. Uh, and fertilizers, synthetic fertilizers, big source of nitrous oxide, a greenhouse gas. Mm -hmm. But if we recouple crops and livestock production, and um, use that animal manure to be part of fertilization, well, that would be great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So anyhow, those are just some rambling thoughts, Marie. You know me. I, um, we talked earlier about how venture capital is making its mm -hmm. way into agriculture in new and interesting ways. And I guess my question to you is, is where do you see venture capital moving and how will it shape agriculture and the foods that we eat? Well, just um, one last point on this livestock thing to the venture capital uh, question. W livestock production may not always be the same. We've heard a lot about innovation. I was down in Hawaii recently for work. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, I, I really was there for work. And I visited a company, Ambrosia, which is part of a, the hatch accelerator on the Big Island. And they're working on a seaweed um, feed for, for cattle that, will, um, that promises to greatly reduce methane production. So hmm. there's a venture capital investment. If you can give me the next slide, please. So, I have done a lot of work in ag tech over the last five or six years. I'm a venture partner. I've been a venture partner in an ag tech firm in Europe. Um, I've been an advisor to S2G Ventures, which is a lot of Lucas Walton's money down in Chicago. And I'm constantly getting this uh, array of pitch decks with people, um, you know, pitching all kinds of ideas. In 2020, which is the last number I saw, we had $31 billion invested in ag tech. So it's the real new money. When you look at government spending and research, and, and this was um, raised yesterday as well, in government spending in ag research, it's been declining over the years. Mm -hmm. um, we are really losing ground when we look at what China spends, what India spends on ag research. The new money has really been coming in from the private sector, and it's been very focused on these venture capital, ag tech ideas. Um, do I buy it all? No. Um, some of it, I think, is it's just going to bust. But there have been some uh, innovations I've been really excited about. I've been really excited about Insect. Um, it's one of the um, first companies I did due diligence on. It's a facility uh, in France where they rear insects for protein. And um, one of the things we were targeting is uh, uh, fish feed. Mm -hmm. You know, we are um, going into the oceans. We're taking out a lot of the tiny species to feed farm fish. So we're disrupting the ocean ecosystem to feed. I mean, it's wacky. It's mm -hmm. wacky thinking. And so the idea here is that we develop a uh, insect substitute for farm fish. Mm. And you know, the, there are a lot of cultures where people eat insects. It's not, you know, it's not a big practice here in the United States. And I was really grateful. I make my students do a class on my sustainable food course on insect protein. And uh, they have a little group project, and certainly most semesters, some clever student decides, I'm going to go on the internet, I'm going to get some insects, and everyone's going to have to try them in class. So the last time this happened, I was luckily sitting in the front of the class. And the really big bugs, there was an assortment tray that was shared. And the really big bugs were like the people in the back of the class, because everyone picked the little ones in the front, so I was safe. But anyhow, I do think that insect protein is part of our future. I think starting with um, fish feed, moving on to pet food, and eventually, hopefully, human food. That makes sense. Um, I'm really excited about um, Appeal Biosciences. Appeal Sciences, you may have heard of this company um, in Santa Barbara. 
where James Rogers, the CEO, it was his doctoral dissertation. He figured out how to extract a, um, a substance in the fruit and make a biofilm from it. Uh, the first big success story there, avocado. Mm -hmm. And so it's imperceptible to us as consumers. It's part of the avocado itself. But what they've done is they've coated it and it retards the spoilage of the avocado. Mm -hmm. So it really goes to food waste. And we know that, you know, up to a third of the world's food is wasted. And so that kind of technology is really exciting. Mm -hmm. um, I really like, uh, what is it called? Uh, Monarch Tractor, which is um, also a California, it's the t Tesla of tractors. Hmm. So it's, uh, it's uh, electric. It's auto-driving, auto you know, it, it, it's without a person. I mean, that's pretty cool, especially with all the labor stuff that um, is pressing in American agriculture. Mm -hmm. um, people can't get legal labor because of all the impasses in immigration reform in this country. Mm -hmm. We're all um, very dependent on farm workers and farm workers who are immigrants, um, legal or not. And that's been a real crisis in American agriculture. I heard yesterday a lot of talk about food as medicine. One of the things a lot of venture capitalists are interested in is trying to um, set it up so that we all are having food that's really prescribed for us, not pills, not like the Jetsons and that old cartoon, but, but food that's really calibrated to our medical needs, our um, uh, family histories. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, someday, getting health insurers to pay for that, Medicare to pay for that, and the like. So I think there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in ag tech. All of the, what I will call faux foods, the um, meat alternatives, the dairy alternatives, the cheese alternatives, um, we'll see. They're very trendy now. Um, I have a colleague who's got a paper in um, review where she looked at the supermarket SKU, the SKU data, and found that um, a lot of the people who were buying alternatives to meat, like a Beyond Meat or an Impossible Burger, that sort of thing, weren't actually um, buying less meat. They were buying less plant-based foods. So <laughs> let's see if that gets through review and what all that means. Uh, a lot of these foods have a lot more sodium. Um, they're, they're very, very processed. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know if they're ultimately going to be big wins, mm -hmm. but time will tell. But ag tech, that's in the venture capital stuff, that's really um, moving and shaking in the food space. If you were here yesterday, you heard a provocative talk by your colleague, uh, what, uh, Andrew, about what Soylent Green got wrong. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you've sort of hinted at this in your last uh, answer, but um, what do you think the consumer experience might be like in 20, 30 years? Will we be buying really different foods or maybe more plant-based foods? Do you have any predictions there? All I know is I want to see that movie now. I saw it was a brilliant talk, and I said, I got to see that movie, Andrew. He's like, oh, yeah, I want to watch it. And I gave away the punchline. I still have to see it. So if you missed his talk yesterday, do watch that movie. It was, it was a great talk. Um, next slide, please. So um, this is also Dan Barber. This is a photograph of what you might get if you go to the restaurant. He's just celebrating well-grown, um, well well-bred fruits and vegetables. Um, these are all vegetables, obviously. Uh, a, little, uh, a little salt, a little oil, so delicious. Um, I'm really interested in the power of deliciousness. That's one of our five strategic research goals at my center. You're going to get um, so many people to change dietary habits because it's better for them personally. You're going to get so many people who are going to change because it's necessary for planetary health. Mm -hmm. Hedonism. I mean, getting people to change because it's really delicious, I don't think we should forget. People do crave. Um, food, and as Andrew said yesterday, there's a whole lot of identity wrapped up in food. I think this is particularly true for younger generations. There's this great book out there called Generation Yum, and it's about young people <laughs> identifying with food, 
um, their association with different groups. I see it in my own two kids who are in their early 20s. It's really, really important. So, um, you know, there's, there's something so pure about that. Yeah. I mean, I'm pointing to this, yeah, behind me. Um, there's been a whole lot of uh, noise recently about processed food. Should we be having processed food? Um, this really came out of Brazil. Just like the United States has dietary guidelines for Americans, the DGAs, you know, it used to be the Food Guide Pyramid, now it's MyPlate, uh, myplate.gov. I helped develop that, which the message of that food icon is we should be eating half a plate of fruits and vegetables. Countries around the world do dietary guidelines, and in Brazil, in 2014, they came out with dietary recommendations that said avoid ultra-processed food. Uh, the problem with thinking about processed food is we don't have a very sophisticated vocabulary when it comes to processed food. Hmm. It's, I think about um, those baby carrots. When they came out with baby carrots, which I hope we all know is they're not really baby carrots, right? <laughs> they're processed to be little carrots. And it's been great because kids have really, everyone actually, not just kids, it really helped sales of carrots skyrocket. It's processed food. That's not the same thing as um, Cheetos, cheese that goes crunch. <laughs> so I think, you know, I don't know if it's true or not. They always say that Eskimos have a lot of words for snow, and I just say snow or crunchy snow. That's about the uh, amount of sophistication in my vocabulary when I think of snow. I think we need to come up with different words to talk about processing and food, mm -hmm. because a lot of processed food makes a lot of sense. It's good for you. It's a way to preserve food. It's a way to get food to some of the food deserts we heard about yesterday. Um, so, so we'll see uh, where that all brings us. But um, there's this, this uh, idea that food has to be absolutely um, fresh. Frozen food can be very healthy. You know, you can get something that's pulled off a field in California, flash frozen, and come to the East Coast in New York in, uh, in a matter of hours, and it's going to have more nutritional value than something that maybe was grown locally but sat out on a farm sand in the hot sun and saw a lot of the nutrition evaporate. So we just need to think about things in a more... Um, thoughtful way. Well, you were front and center in thinking about things in a thoughtful way as you worked on the Org Organic Food Production Act mm -hmm. and how do we classify and understand organics. Um, I think uh, 40 years ago people thought, oh, this will, this will never catch on, but obviously there's a lot more interest in organic food production, and I know this is an area of great interest to you, so would you care to say where organic foods are going and how it compatible is it with the contemporary food systems? I hope we have three hours. Mm. No. I was going to say <laughs> maybe five minutes, so we actually do have time for questions. So not, not diatribes, but questions. If you have some questions, you can start lining up. OK, so uh, next slide, please. Um, just uh, promoting my own work, I suppose. But we just came out with a report, Grow Organic which has about 400 scientific references. We did it in partnership with Natural Resources Defense Council and Californians for Pesticide Reform. We make the case why organics important for human health, for environment, for economics, mm -hmm. really, really important rural development, and for climate. So it's a good reference report. It's downloadable on NRDC's website, on my Sweetie Center website at ASU. And then last year, we came out with a report, the critical to-do list for organic agriculture, 46 recommendations for the president. Can anyone tell me why 46? Thank you. This is a smart crowd, the 46th <laughs> president. It's not because I couldn't have come up with 146 ideas. But um, anyhow, there are a lot of things we'd like to do to see organic grow. Uh, Bob Quinn yesterday, great organic farmer, um, producing kanmut, nice snacks. Uh, he talked about how right now it represents 6% of the food Americans buy. Um, also, uh, our other organic farmer yesterday mentioned how 
he was discouraged that we had all of this um, organic corn coming in from Turkey and disrupting uh, markets here for U.S. organic farmers. Right on, uh, we import about $2.3 billion of organic food that's tracked by the federal government. That's only 100 items. It's much bigger than that. And what breaks my heart about that is I just see lost opportunity for those young farmers mm -hmm. that we need to attract. The USDA does a census of agriculture every five years. The last one was 2017. We know from that data that more of the young people coming into American agriculture are going organic and they tend to be the people who are farming full time. Mm -hmm. So it's a lure, but they need to have strong markets. And the food that we're importing, a lot of it um, is coffee. Uh, we don't grow a lot of coffee in this country. Forgive my, my friends in Hawaii, forgive me. Mm -hmm. uh, bananas, you know, that sort of thing. But a lot of it is what we grow here and during the seasons when we grow it. So we really should be thinking about ways to promote organic and transition farmers to organic the federal government just came out with a $300 million program to help transition farmers to organic. We need to do it at a much um, more rapid pace. Bob predicted if we keep this exponential, uh, exponential growth going, by 2050, we'll all, 100% will be organic. But 2050 is too far away. And I have one last comment, Marie, and then we can ask questions. Regenerative, that's the trend. Everyone's excited about regenerative out with the old, in with the new, old is organic. But regenerative is where organic was about 40 years ago, back, um, well, I guess it's been 33 years ago since I wrote that law, where we had standards, all different standards across the country, both private and um, public, and we needed to have a national standard. Regenerative is, um, has so many definitions, it's almost, uh, meaningless and uh, that whole effort is going to have to go through the rigorous process that organic did. Organic is the prized eco-label of the globe. It's backed by strong standards enforced by government. So we'll see if regenerative gets there. Great. Do we have questions? Please step up to the mic and introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Molly. I'm a geography student from Bucknell University. Um, you just kind of touched about this with regenerative farming, but as a young woman farmer, what kind of advice and support avenues can we make available to continue encouraging the younger generation to get into farming, whether that's pushing the regenerative system, which is what I have experience in, or just reframing the eco economics with the markets. I was wondering if you could touch a little bit more on that. Well, one of the key things, that's a great question. I wish I had the perfect answer for you. I think the government has enough tools in the toolbox to lure young people into farming, but not enough to get them over the hump because it's really hard. And the capital costs of uh, getting into agriculture, particularly if you don't come from the family with the farm, is really, really tough. Um, so government needs to do more policy to help support people coming into uh, farming. I also think that um, the cornerstone of organic agriculture is crop rotation. We all need to eat more pulses. We need to um, create uh, good markets for some of these uh, crops that are really, really important for regeneration. Thanks. Why don't we have uh, two or three questions, ask them quickly, and then I'll, that will give Kathleen time to respond to them all. So go ahead. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, we didn't hear enough about uh, what regenerative truly means. Uh, are you talking about the harnessing of microbial communities to be able to uh, replicate the environment where we can um, grow stuff that is not natural to the environment? be able to localize supply chain, work with local farmers in order to create those local supply chains. Um, what, where are you uh, in terms of uh, that type of regeneration? Good, we'll take that. And the next question. Um, yeah, thank you both for such a rich discussion. Um, Dr. Merrin, you briefly mentioned the need to recouple agriculture and livestock. I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit on the state of that process, um, maybe some examples from your research or what like barriers to that you've identified? 
Great, thank you. And your question, please. Um, my question is about land ownership in the United States. There's been an extended trend of, um, I guess not venture capital, but old school capital kind of buying up a lot of farmland in the US. And I was wondering how you see that trend going forward into the future, especially about new farmers coming in and pushing old farmers out. Okay, we gotta keep track of these. Okay. Why don't we answer those? Okay, Where do you want so to that last one, because I'm old and my brain is mush, <laughs> we lose about 2,000 acres of farm and ranch land a day, according to American Farmland Trust. The largest owner of farmland in the United States is Bill Gates. Uh, yes, there's a lot of venture capital going in and mm. buying up land. Uh, when you look at projections about world food needs, uh, that's a smart investment. But it does make um, it very difficult for, again, young people to begin a career in farming. And we need to we need to do something about that, and I don't think that happens with the private market alone. I think it needs government assistance. Mm -hmm. On regenerative, there was an article that came out, I wish I wrote it, in 2020 by some colleagues in Colorado, and I wish I could remember the lead author's name, but it looked at regenerative. It looked at 229 journal articles and 25 practitioner organization websites seeking a common definition of regenerative. Oddly enough, um, there was only like a 30, 30 of those journal articles that even suggested a definition of regenerative. What are, what are we academics doing? And <laughs> all of the practitioner websites had a definition, but there was very little overlap. So the conclusion of the authors was that it's an area ripe for greenwashing. So when you asked me what did I mean by regenerative, I thought your list of all those questions were really great, um, but they haven't been sorted out. And so there are a lot of competing uh, definitions and with all the money coming out of the federal government on climate smart agriculture and regenerative, um, we'll see how that all comes together. I still argue that organic is the original climate smart label. Okay, the young woman's question was livestock, and livestock an example of recoupling livestock and um, and animals. Well, I see that a lot when I visit organic farms. Um, the other thing that's really interesting too is um, Duncan Family Farms is outside of Phoenix. It's the largest organic farm in the country, not just a um, Phoenix location. They have sites in some other states as well. They're doing a lot of really interesting stuff with composting um, and, and also bringing in some of the municipal waste and working with grocery stores. Um, so I think that fertilization issue is very um, upfront and, and on people's minds in food production. It saves them a lot of money, particularly right now with fertilizer prices soaring. Hopefully this is the moment in time where we say, well, what can we do differently? How do we produce without these synthetic chemicals? Um, what can we do with biological approaches, nature-based solutions? That's mm -hmm. the conversation I want to have. And last question. If you have time. Sure. Um, hi, uh, my name is Steele. I'm a high school human geography teacher. So when I take kids through organic in comparison to conventional or regenerative methods, right, they get excited, but they also get pretty hesitant about how scalable can it be given the increase in price. And you know, they talk about like, well, I, my family couldn't afford this kind of food. So I'm, and I struggle to uh, explain to them how or, or how, how that price issue could be overcome um, on a large scale. Um, and I wonder if, you know, the, the solution I tend to go to is just look at how, look at how small a percentage of Americans' budget we spend on food in comparison to other parts of the world, etc. I'm wondering if that's the route you would go if you were talking to a group of teenagers or if there's other uh, data, other arguments I'm missing. It's a brilliant question. Thank you for that. Again, not an easy answer. One of our other research priorities at the Sweetie Center is true cost accounting of food. I don't know if anyone's heard about this. It's been an effort that I've been involved in about eight years now. Globally, hundreds of scholars trying to come up with a way to put literal price tags on externalities of food production, both positive and negative. Not with the idea or the intention to make food more expensive because, as you say, so many people can't afford to put a healthy plate of food on the table, even in this country, but to create a transparency 
for how much food really costs, when we calculate in the health costs of, of, of eating certain foods, when we, we calculate what those synthetic chemicals do to our biodiversity, what have you. Creating that transparency for both decision makers in the private and the public sector, hopefully that changes what they do. And if it doesn't, we at least have a means to hold them accountable. Because government is going to have to intervene. Organic is um, probably less than 1% of the money USDA puts out the door in support of American agriculture is for organic. Hmm. There are other systems of production that are preferenced. We could change that, and that would bring down those prices. Thank you very much. Well, as, as you can tell, we have a national treasure here in Kathleen <laughs> Merrigan, and she's going to be around for the rest of the day. So find her, talk to her, ask her questions, and let's give her a big round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Marie and Kathleen. That was really great, and I think you're going to have a lot of conversation going on. As many of you know, AGS has been leading the cause for geography and geospatial science for 171 years. 